In this episode I drop things, once more I compare boxes and I click things into place. If you guessed it by now, kudos to you. Well, this makes sense if you have seen the previous episode, so I invite you to watch it to fully understand. But as a quick breakdown, I'm basically exploring custom mini computers from various brands to see how much they have advanced and if I can make it a desktop replacement. Thus my quest has brought me to this, the mighty Phantom Canyon from Intel's 11th gen enthusiast Nuke lineup. And oh boy I'm so happy I got it, because as you will see this is one of Intel's finest products. So why this one? Well primarily the form factor, because it's all about maximum portability within a best value proposition. I will reveal the price very soon. Furthermore, this is not their first release, for that we need to go back all the way to 2016 when they launched the Skull Canyon which defines this form factor of UCFF as they call it. Long story short, it uses laptop hardware in this custom format, it had an i7-6770HQ which is a quad core with 8 threads, turbo was up to 3.5GHz and the TDP threshold was 45 watts. Regarding video output, it relied on the integrated Iris Pro 580 graphics, which apparently is somewhat similar to a Vega graphics from the later released AMD APUs. Coming back to the present, because I already had the Lenovo with the Vega 11, there was no point to get this Skull Canyon from an upgrade point of view. Plus, they were a bit more expensive at around 250 to 300 bucks. Two years later, Intel then released something really special, the Nuke Hades Canyon, that came in two flavors but will focus on the more powerful variant. This was a curious cookie because Intel collaborated with AMD themselves to make this exotic chipset, which used an Intel Kaby Lake CPU with a weird name, 8809G. As before, an i7 quad core with 8 threads and a higher boost now to 4.2 GHz. But the real kicker was the integrated graphics which was an Radeon RX Vega MGH which used 4GB of HPM2 high speed memory. And the TDP was set for the whole package up to 100 watts because they were onto the same chip if you can believe it. This made the Hades grow in size over the Skull Canyon, now featuring two fans and from what I understand later down the line there were problems with drivers from both Intel and AMD. Of course considering the ultra custom nature of this joint collaboration. I have no idea about the situation today so feel free to leave a comment if you still have one. Another drawback was the noise since these tend to get really hot. Alas when it came to raw horsepower, this is quite the capable combo that AMD Vega MGH got very close to a GTX 1060. They can be found anywhere from 400 to 600 depending on what RAM and storage people will include with the buy since these can be had as a bare bones from factory where you just add your own RAM and storage. And finally here it is the best one of them all, at least in my eyes, the Phantom Canyon. I have no idea what Intel did to make this thing so capable whilst being also silent. Yes, this was praised of how silent it is even in full load. If that doesn't sound impressive, wait to see what it has under the hood. This time they went with an RTX 2060 6GB Max-P variant, basically the more powerful refresh laptop chip, the 115W TDP model. So here it is compared to its other brothers for a complete perspective. The weird naming scheme for the CPU is maintained, an i7 Tiger Lake 1165G7 CPU, also a quad core 8 threaded chip, but this time up to 4.7 GHz in turbo, all cores to 4.1 GHz in boost, and wait for it, all of this under 25 watts on the stock profile. I kid you not, this CPU punches above its weight class, its IPC is highly impressive and makes one hell of a snappy CPU in my current workflow. It even has the Iris XC graphics built in the CPU, which in combination with a dedicated GPU will let you connect up to 4 displays at once. Connectivity is epic, I mean two ports capable up to 40GB per second, which is of course Thunderbolt 4, a total of 8 USB ports, an HDMI 2.A, thus 4K60, and a mini display port 1.4B with an output of 8K60. I mean all of this in a 1.3 liter book shaped enclosure, absolutely mental. These were over a grand brand new, even bare bones, so at the time of their release in 2021 I could never afford it one. Well, now I finally have one, brand new, with warranty, which I managed to snag on an Easter sale discount for exactly, wait for it, 1490 quid, or let's just say 500 bucks. Call it dumb luck, tech gods intervention, but when I saw it randomly on Google while doing research for this video, I just pulled the trigger since in the next few hours they were all sold out. Yeah, go figure. I mean yeah, we can build something similar, maybe more powerful for the same money, but nowhere near to such a complete and cool compact package, even when compared to those Lenovo Tinies with a T1000 GPU, which are double in price, and I think we can all agree that there is no comparison in the GPU department. 
And yes, before I even show you the benchmarks and tests, I can fully answer by now the premise of this series that this is now my main computer as a full desktop replacement. Of course, this applies to my workflow and needs, and we will come back to this in the conclusion. Presentation is top notch from Intel in this jewelry box like, where you get plenty of accessories, like a VESA mounting plate and this cool vertical mount. But for now I'm using it flat on the table because I'm just a bit too scared to knock it down by mistake. As for the transparent film, they are acrylic plastic sheets that if you own a special printer you can make your own design you want for the top RGB area where the stock skull is. As seen in the Hades one, yes, you will get a chunky external PSU brick at 230 watts, which is a good thing because it will dissipate heat faster. Overall build quality is excellent, perfect fit and finish, with a lot of cooling cutouts on all sides. To open it up, we just need to remove these top 8 Allen bolts, which will reveal where you would insert your own custom logo design. To access further the RAM and storage section, we need to remove 5 more screws, which are conveniently numbered for us, and don't forget to remove the RGB power plug on the left here. This metal plate has thermal pads on the back that will touch the M.2 drives to a further heat dissipation, so make sure you only install non-heatsink drives. This computer will accept two 8TB SSDs, so plenty of storage capability down the line, and one extra long M.2. As for RAM, the max is 64GB at 3200MHz, but the same as before as seen on the Lenovo's, make sure they are one2 volts. Also kudos to Intel for making the BIOS battery replaceable and easy to access. I'm not gonna take it apart further, but underneath we have the GPU and CPU, both soldered of course and connected to a common heatsink at the back. There is plenty of copper heat pipes for each area and each chip has its own AVC fan, as in advanced hydraulic bearing, which apparently are this silent because there is no contact between the shaft and the bearing. If you ever had one of these Intel nooks, then you'll know that the BIOS is pretty cool and well made. A key advantage with this system is that Intel gives you plenty of tuning and increments adjusting for the CPU and fans and even the RAM, a fact that we know is a locked endeavor on most OEM mini computers and even on some laptops. Furthermore, there is even a proprietary Intel management software that gives you access to plenty of settings in the desktop. It's called the Intel Nook Software Studio, where you have full control of the lights and the RGB skull logo, for example. Yes, you can even change the color of the hard drive and power on buttons. Wicked stuff. Here you can select your power profile and even make your own in the BIOS. And finally, this is a system monitor for the usage and temps. Let me show you a quick tip regarding this row here. Always the four digits after the big sequence is the BIOS version. This is helpful if you quickly want to know which one you have, and the same is confirmed in CPU-Z. A nice benefit with an NVIDIA GPU is that we can download the driver straight from NVIDIA's website, and pretty much all the drivers needed, Windows will take care of them. Intel even provides an app for easy access, and all in all I had no problems to set this up from the get-go, which as you know it's quite important since it's such a custom job. Now let's talk about the noise since it's one of the main selling points. So this is the system when I let it render a 4K video. I mean, for me, this is a number one criteria because if I can't record my voiceovers, the system is useless to me if it's too loud and I have to do extra work to cancel the background noise. So yeah, massive win here. Now here is the noise output and let's see the temperatures and the gaming performance all in one go in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which is a really demanding title on both the CPU and GPU. I can hear it if I just focus on it, but it's nothing too serious to distract me from enjoying the game. As for the gaming performance, the fact that these are max settings and I can enjoy it with an average of 55 FPS, for me is a massive win. 
I have a feeling any dips will be cured if I set a CPU on its maximum performance mode, but again, I remember I got dips even on my previous system with a Ryzen 5 5600X with a GTX 1080 from time to time. Now here is Cyberpunk version 1.6, again a benchmark for today's gaming test. You saw the quality settings and the fact that I can get over 60 FPS on high, what more can I ask for? Suffice to say that any other day-to-day -day tasks, the Tiger as I call it, it's completely dead silent and again all of this on the stock profile as it came out of the box. As you saw we have plenty of tinkering available for the fans and power delivery which for now I don't need to touch. Regarding the snappiness, as you can see it's pretty much flawless in Premiere Pro with my current workload. If you want a synthetic, here is R23 and a memory benchmark run in ADA64. We just saw its potential and capability despite the fact that it's what, 2 years old by now? So let's tackle the downsides. Well, the obvious one, you can't upgrade anything besides the RAM and storage, even the Wi-Fi module is soldered, at least it's Wi-Fi 6. So time will tell when the CPU and GPU will be obsolete and how much driver support Intel will offer it. For me it does everything that I require at 1080p, it's extremely portable and best of all, quiet in full low. Sadly Intel hasn't released or mentioned of a true successor and by that I mean the same form factor as these three so far. On Intel's charts the Serpent Canyon is in the same category, but it's way bigger in size, so yeah it depends how you look at it. Who knows, maybe one day Intel might do another epic one in a tiny enclosure especially that AMD just released the exciting series of RDNA 3 iGPUs, so I think there is a bright future for these machines.